Hello and welcome to our webinar on making sense of the regulatory landscape for ambulatory practices in 2023 and beyond. My name is Chelsea Grover and I'm the marketing manager for DAS Health. Before we get started on today's webinar, I want to take a moment to explain the process for the presentation. First, I'd like to mention this webinar will be recorded and that we'll send out a copy of the slides along with the recording within the next week. Next, I see a number of new folks have joined us today, so this seems like a great time to do a quick reminder of who DAS Health is. DAS Health is a leading provider of health IT and management solutions and a trusted consultant to many physicians groups, hospitals, and healthcare systems across North America. We offer a full range of business and technology solutions to help you in your practice, including consulting services, RCM, remote patient monitoring, MSP managed IT services, hosting, cybersecurity, and obviously government regulations, just to name a few. If you'd like any more detailed information on any of that, drop us a note in the questions area and we'd be happy to fill you in. Next, I wanted to mention some exciting webinars that we have planned in the new year. In January, we'll be presenting Stop the Manual Madness, Maximizing Aprimas for MIPS. Then in March, we'll be covering Lessons Learned from the Pros, MIPS Missions Do's and Don'ts. Make sure to follow DAS Health on LinkedIn and social media so you don't miss announcements for these, along with other useful tech tips and healthcare industry reminders. Okay, so back to today's webinar and making sense of the regulatory landscape. Now, normally we would save time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions, but because we have so much information to get through today, we're going to try something a little bit different. Feel free to ask questions using the questions area of the webinar control panel, but instead of answering them at the end live like we usually do, we're going to follow up with you directly using the email that you use to register for the webinar. And finally, for audio clarity purposes, everyone's phone will remain muted throughout the entire webinar. If you experience audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. And again, questions may be entered in the questions box. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Lindsay Lanning is the Government Incentives Manager at DAS Health. She'll be your guide on today's journey into 2023. And Bridget Peterson and Kimmy Watson are also on the Government Incentives Experts teams at DAS Health, contributing authors to today's presentations and are on hand to help with questions. So with that, Lindsay, I'm gonna let you get started. Perfect. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar today, Making Sense of the Regulatory Landscape for Ambulatory Practices in 2023 and Beyond. This is quite possibly the longest title we have ever had, um, which suits this presentation well, because spoiler alert, um, it's a long one. Um, so go ahead and get comfy. So on today's agenda, we actually plan to shed light on the critical healthcare regulations that impact your practice. Um, I am warning you again, we have a lot to cover and I purposely made the slide content heavy. So when we send out a copy, you will have all this information. So specifically, we're gonna cover the physician fee schedule final rule, which includes updates to the MIPS program. Um, the No Surprises Act, as there have been, you know, a recent final rule released and a lot of activities surrounding this specific rule. And then the Cures Act updates. Um, and then other important regulations and, and healthcare industry updates, such as the new Prior Authorization Act that was just released, HIPAA updates to come in 2023, um, EPCS requirements, AUC, um, so, so much more. Now, this is not going to be a deep dive into the No Surprises Act or Cures Act. It is just an update on each. We do have full webinars on each of these topics. We did previously. Um, I believe they were both in the last few months and they're accessible on our website if you need a deeper dive to fill those gaps. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, starting with the final rule for the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. So CMS published the final 2023 Physician Fee Schedule rule on November 1st, 2022. And it included important policy updates on issues such as obviously the Medicare payment rates, telehealth services, um, you know, after the public health emergency, um, MIPS, the MIPS value pathways or the MVPs, and then accountable care organizations. So we're going to cover all of these updates besides the ACO specific updates. Um, specifically, we're not going to deep dive into the Medicare shared savings program updates um, because there are a ton, but we will cover the rest and of course deep dive into the MIPS changes. I know, I know, uh, you know, they say you shouldn't play favorites, but MIPS is definitely our favorite. So we will review this one pretty, pretty extensively. So keep in mind, right, the rule itself includes much more than just MIPS updates. Um, this rule finalized a cut to the conversion factor to $33.08 in calendar year 2023, compared to the $34.61 that it was in 2022. 
so with this information, we now know there is a potential 10.5% or just about that cut in Medicare reimbursement, physician fee schedule reimbursement in 2023. Now, this is a culmination of previous pieces of legislation. So there was the 2% sequester cut from the Budget Control Act of 2011, and that's already in effect as of July. Um, this was delayed once due to COVID, and then they, they implemented 1%, and then the, you know, the following 1% was actually enacted in July of 2022. So this is already coming off of your claims. Then we have the 4% sequester cut coming from the PAYGO Act of 2010, and that's set to take effect in 2023. And now, add to that that 4.5% conversion factor cut we just found out from this rule that's also set to take effect in 2023. So we already have that 2% cut, but that additional 8.5% cut is coming in 2023 unless Congress takes action. Now, as expected, Congress is receiving a lot of feedback on this. Um, this is not something CMS or other agencies have any hand in. This is all pending congressional action. Now, there is momentum to address this cut before the end of the year. Um, we even have seen some proposed rules, uh, but nothing solid just, let, just yet. So I think you can understand or, or see why earning a positive payment adjustment under the MIPS program would be a huge help in future years to offset any of these cuts. Now, the final rule also addressed telehealth post-pandemic or public health emergency. So following the expansion of telehealth during COVID-19, Congress had enacted the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022. Uh, basically what that did among other things is extend certain telehealth flexibilities for 151 days following the conclusion of the PHE. So these are gonna include things like maintaining that payment parity between in-person and telehealth through 2023, um, delaying the in-person requirements that are typically in place for telemental health services, um, extending those crucial originating site and geographic site, you know, restrictions or flexibilities, um, allowing rural health clinics and FQHCs to serve as distant sites, expanding the list of eligible telehealth providers, and then, of course, you know, providing reimbursement or paying for services that were audio only. Now, we still don't know when the public health emergency will end. Um, they are renewed on 90-day periods. And the Biden administration has promised to give 60 days notice prior to the public health emergency expiring. So all evidence points to the PHE being renewed in January and then extended probably again through April of 2023. So what this means is the earliest we expect to see these flexibilities I mentioned expire would be September 2023. Now, another quick note before we look at the MIPS specific update for next year is the other track under the QPP, the APM updates. Now, again, these are just the notable updates. There are many more, but one I really wanted to point out, since I'm sure a lot of you on the call have providers in both MIPS and some in APM agreements, the 5% lump sum bonus for any provider that achieves that QP status in an APM expires in 2022. Meaning, if you're in an APM in 2023, there is no financial bonus. Now, you will still get the benefit of being exempt from MIPS reporting, but as it stands, there's no positive payment award for this track next year. So, you know, I wonder if we're going to see a lot of providers maybe switch back over to MIPS to try and earn an incentive, you know, which is the exact opposite that CMS wanted or intended. Um, again, this is actually not controlled by CMS like you would think. This was actually written into law and is, again, controlled by Congress. So, a lot of decisions for Congress to make this year that will impact payments for providers directly starting next year and beyond. So again, we're gonna be keeping a very close eye on this as well. Okay, so on to MIPS in 2023. Um, you can see from 2022 to 2023, this comparison up here, there are no changes. This is the first time in history of the program that there were no changes in weight or thresholds or penalties. This signals to me two things. One, admission of guilt. <laughs> this program is extremely difficult in 2022 and that is what they are admitting by keeping everything the same. Two, this program is fully implemented. All transitional items or perks that were built into the program or the first five years of the programs um, that sort of helped us along like bonus points for an example um, are gone for good. Now let's look at each category with a quick overview and the changes we're gonna see next year. So 
For quality, you can see it's mainly just housekeeping items. Um, reporting still a full year. There's going to be a total of 198 quality measures for next year, so they are adding nine quality measures. They are making changes to 76 of those quality measures. They are removing 11 of them, and they're doing a partial removal of two quality measures. Um, so it's actually the influenza and pneumococcal vaccination measures that are being removed. Um, they're being removed from traditional MIPS, but they're not being removed from the MVP. So if you are reporting under an MVP next year, which we'll talk about later, you can still report on these two measures. Um, they also increased the data completeness threshold to 75% for 2024 and 2025. So no huge changes, um, but ones to be aware of, especially if you usually report any of the measures that will be removed or have changes next year. And here are the list of the newly added measures and those that will be removed. Um, again, we will send a copy of these out so you have them, but I want to remind you the finalized changes to scoring for new measures as well. So a measure in its first year of the program, so brand new, right, um, has a floor of seven points. Even if you only earn, let's say, 5% on this measure, you're going to get seven points. And then year two, same rules apply, but the floor is five points. So this could be a great option for next year to consider, you know, maybe one of these new measures, especially if you're losing one of the ones you typically report on that you see on that removed list there. Now for PI, um, unfortunately, not as quick and easy. So CMS has made more than a few minor adjustments here. Reporting is still going to be 90 days, but the weights and scoring are totally shaken up. So you can see the point values from 2022 compared to 2023. PDMP is proposed, or I'm sorry, finalized now to be mandatory. There's also another HIE measure option for TESCA to get credit. And both of these changes redistributed points differently than previous years. You know, you can see the increase on the immunization electronic case reporting. You can see the decrease, you know, put on the two HIE measures as well to accommodate more options. So as I mentioned, CMS officially finalized the requirement to partic participate in a PDMP or a prescription drug monitoring program. So this is when your providers are prescribing a controlled substance. They look the patient up to make sure they're not getting this anywhere else or if they show patterns of drug seeking behavior before they prescribe that. Um, it is still going to be a yes no attestation next year, although this may shift. I wouldn't be surprised to a numerator denominator measure in future years. So, next year, um, you're going to have to test yes for at least one Schedule II opioid or Schedule III or IV drug electronically prescribed using your certified EHR during your 90 days. Um, so, you need to use data from your, your certified EHR to conduct that query of a PDMP. This doesn't mean it has to be integrated into your EHR. It can still be external. Um, but again, this, this lookup of the PDMP has to occur prior to transmission. And if there are multiple drugs prescribed on the same day, it's not going to require multiple transmissions. Now, note here, this does include Schedule 2, 3, and 4, no matter the dosage. This is actually an expanded definition from the bonus version of this measure that we see in 2022. Now, there will be exclusions available. So similar to the e-prescribing measure, if you're unable to electronically prescribe these types of drugs, um, or if you write fewer than 100 uh, permissible prescriptions during your 90-day reporting period, you can exclude. Um, there is also a special exclusion for 2023 reporting, and it says that if querying a PDMP would impose an excessive workflow or cost burden um, to start that next year, you can exclude next year. But again, keep in mind that's only going to be a 2023 exclusion. CMS also finalized a third option to satisfy the HIE objective for the 2023 performance period. It is the participation in the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, um, or what we call TEFCA. This now means we have three options to participate or meet this measure. So one's going to involve two data-driven measures. Um, I think we're, we're most familiar with this option to report on. So that's the sending and receiving CCDAs. That's the numerator denominator measures. And then there are two other options that are both attestation measures, and they focus on ongoing, more proactive interoperability and data exchange, the HIE bidirectional, um, and as well as the enable exchange under TESCA. 
Then we have our public health measures. So these were actually changed last year for 2022 reporting. Um, we now have to report on immunization reporting and electronic case reporting. All the other options that we had, you know, the public health, the syndromic surveillance, the, the cancer case reporting, et cetera, those are all optional for bonus points now. Um, and the weighting has changed as a result of the reorg under PI from 10 points to 25 points. But there was a modification made for 2023. So reporting this measure now, you know, if you, if you think back, we had these levels of active engagement. Well, what they've done is they've combined options one and two into one option called pre-production and validation, and they renamed option three to validated data production. So you have two levels of active engagement instead of three. MIPS eligible clinicians will now be required to submit their level of engagement starting actually in 2024. So starting in, in I'm sorry, starting in 2023. So 2023, you have to tell them what level of engagement you're participating in. Starting in 2024, you have to progress to option two or level two in the next performance period after attesting option one or level one for a particular measure. So this is a big change from what we're used to. We have to, you know, one, actually let CMS know what level of engagement we're in. And then two, you know, we have to show that progression um, within one year if you were just in that pre-production or validation phase. Now, another measure that was changed technically, you know, last year or this year, 2022 reporting, is the protect patient information. So this is the security risk analysis measure. Um, but it was expanded to include the newly added safer guide measure. Um, I just wanted to note that the option to attest no that we currently have in 2022 with no score impact will be removed in 2023. So you will have to complete this at some point in the calendar year next year. And last but not least, the certified EHR tech requirement um, that takes effect next year. So this has not been delayed. A lot of rumors are filing around they might delay this or push this by a year. It has been finalized. It has not been delayed. The 2015 Cures version of certified EHR technology will be required for 2023 reporting. Now, there is some confusion around the deadline of when this version is required to be in place. So the regulation states 1231-2022. However, it really depends on what quality reporting initiative you're participating in. If you're only participating in MIPS, you actually only need this in place before your PI reporting period, which is 90 days. That means at the latest before October 2nd of 2023. And if you happen to be a small practice or under 15 clinicians who you know, don't have to report PI, then you only need it in place by 1231-2023 in order to report your quality data. Now, if you are on the APM track, this is where things may be different. Each APM has its own requirements for when this certified EHR technology or CERT has to be installed. And there are some that say January 1st, 2023. Um, so if you report under the APM, you know, I would hope I'm not the first one telling you this on December 14th, 2022, uh, but please reach out to your reps um, at your specific APM or you know, whoever is handling your, your contracting for that. Um, reach out to those contacts and ask or confirm what is needed, what version is needed, and when. Now, if you're wondering if your EHR is certified to the 2015 Cures version or maybe which version is or going to be, um, you can look that up on the Chapel website and search your EHR vendor and get this information, and that's the link I have on the screen. Then we have the Improvement Activity category. So unlike PI, this category changes um, are really just housekeeping and admin changes. So the requirements are the same. You have to report any continuous 90 days. 50% of your providers in your tax ID must participate in the improvement activity to report as a group. You have to report on a mix of medium weighted and high weighted activities to achieve 40 points for full credit. Um, if you're a small practice, which is under 15 clinicians, you actually earn double points per activity. And of course, you have to keep your documentation. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, have it on file for up to six years in case of an audit. Also new in the last few years, um, if you're reporting through a certified registry, so this may be your first year that you're trying out a certified registry submission option, registries actually have to validate your documentation before they can approve your files or send that attestation to CMS. 
Um, so keep that in mind. If you had not submitted through registry in the past, you know, this is um, a relatively new WER requirement. It's not brand new this year. Um, I believe it started in 2020. And then of course, our advice to you for the improvement activities is to really try and leverage your quality measures. Um, if you look at the improvement activity inventory, there are a lot in there that reference specific ECQMs or MIPS CQMs. You know, if, if you're tracking the closing the loop measure really closely, I know that there's an improvement activity that aligns perfectly with that. And you can actually use, you know, your certified reports to justify and act as documentation for these activities. Um, so we try and say, you know, work smarter, not harder, right? Now, as you can see, we have four new activities and then six that are being removed. Um, so one of, the, one of the ones being removed is actually the consultation of a PDMP or prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, this makes sense, right? If it was gonna be required under PI, CMS certainly wasn't gonna let you get away with double dipping. That would be much too easy. So um, they did go ahead and remove this activity for credit. I did wanna point that one out because that is a high-weighted activity that I know a lot of people have had in place anyway. Um, so please note that we might have to shift some activity selection for next year. And last but not least is cost. So reporting is still a full year. Um, there are no submission you know, requirements here because CMS is actually using your claims data throughout the year to calculate your performance. Um, one thing to note, if the case minimum is not met for any of the measures under cost, the weight for this category will be redistributed to other categories. Um, and then CMS did actually make a change. For 2023, they finalized that a maximum cost improvement score of one percentage point out of 100 percentage points available for the cost performance category, starting with the 2022 performance period. Now, aside from the PI changes, you can see the rest of the categories had pretty minimal housekeeping changes. Um, and that's because CMS is gearing up to, to hopefully sunset MIPS. Um, again, there's no end date scheduled for right now, so no one panic, um, but it will likely be coming you know, in the next, I would say five years or so. Um, and transition to what they are calling MVPs or MIPS value pathways. So again, I am not going to deep dive here as we are going to be doing an entire webinar on this topic alone next year, um, but I do want to review it at a high level and what was finalized. Um, so like I said, MVPs are actually going to become available gradually in 2023 to allow practices to actually you know, sit there and, and review the requirements, you know, maybe update their workflows if it's needed, um, prepare systems, you know, if it's needed to report, you know, that typically wouldn't be on the medical practice, but more on maybe your EHR vendors need to make some changes to how your current MIPS dashboards work or function. Um, the MVP framework really aims to align and connect measures, so your quality measures and your improvement activities across that quality cost and improvement activities performance categories of MIPS, and really tie them back to specific specialties or conditions that you treat. So I wouldn't call it a, a program overhaul or, or really a revamp. It's more of a restructuring in the way that MIPS today would currently work. Um, so to report an MVP, basically you would register for the specific MVP between April 1st and November 30th of the performance year. And then you would not be able to submit or make changes to the MVP you selected after the close of that registration period, so November 30th, basically. And you're not gonna be allowed to report on a different MVP that you didn't register for. So I tell my team, right, think of it as putting your name in the goblet of fire, um, no take backs here. Um, for 2023, however, you can report under both an MVP and traditional MIPS, and CMS is just gonna take the higher score. So it may be a worthwhile exercise, you know, to try and understand the new structure and the measures available to you if possible. If you are interested in MVPs next year, here's the list of the current MVPs. Um, and then they did finalize, you know, adding five new ones in 2023. Um, so again, you know, the new ones here, the promoting wellness, I would say is the biggest one that may apply to the largest majority. Um, the rest are really focused in, like I said, on either a condition or a specialty. You've got cancer care, you've got kidney health, um, looking at neurological conditions. You already had in place emergency medicine or chronic disease management. Um, now, of course, we expect CMS to continue releasing more MVPs each year, so more and more providers can participate. Um, so if one of these on the screen does not apply to you, don't panic. Um, just be patient. They will be, be coming out with more. 
Now some quick updates for reporting this year because we just really can't help ourselves. Um, please note, CMS has updated their NPI lookup tool with the new snapshot data. So if you didn't know, CMS updates your clinician's eligibility for MIPS at multiple points throughout the year. So these updates are based on past and current Medicare Part B claims and then their pay coast data. So each review where they call it a segment technically looks at a 12 month period. It's typically from October to September. Um, they analyze the data from the, first from the first segment, and they release it, and that's the preliminary eligibility determinations. Then they take the second segment's data, they analyze it, and they reconcile it with the first, and then they release the final eligibility determination. So you can see you have to be MIPS eligible to be, um, you know, you, to be MIPS eligible, you have to be eligible in both segments. So looking at the dates here on the screen, right? Um, the first segment is October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021, and then it picks right, picks right back up October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. So those are the segments. The final eligibility was released officially last month in November. So please, please go ahead and check your final eligibility results just to make sure your provider statuses did not change. Um, if you already were MIPS exempt in that first segment, you're never going to change to you know, MIPS eligible. You have to be eligible on both segments, um, as you can see in that graphic there. Um, and of course, this is a reminder, if your practice is still feeling the impact of COVID-19, there is a hardship available. It's due by January 3rd this year. Um, it's just because of how the holidays fall. We definitely recommend getting this done by December 31st. So one thing to note, um, you can submit this for all categories and not report anything, and then you're safe from a penalty. What people don't realize, and I'm sure my team is kicking me right now because some of our secret sauce, um, is that you can actually submit this hardship for all categories, but then override it and submit data for only two categories and get a full score and a full adjustment with only half the data submitted. Um, so think about this, you know, think of COVID still impacting your practice and if this is, you know, something that you'd be interested or, or you know, consider doing. Um, this application or hardship, again, is going to be submitted through your QPP account um, online. There are also hardships that are automatic um, that are available this year for MIPS. So any clinicians who are located in the CMS designated regions that have been affected by extreme and uncontrollable events, such as FEMA designated major disaster areas, um, they're going to have that automatic extreme and uncontrollable circumstances exception applied. So again, looking at this and in how this would work, it is an automatic exception. It would have all four MIPS performance categories re-rated to 0%. Um, the only thing that will, will change is if, if you submit data in the same fashion, it will override that automatic hardship. So these clinicians are the ones that are automatically identified. You technically don't have to submit an exception application. Um, it would be for this year looking at Hurricane Ian for South Carolina and Florida, Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico, parts of Kentucky and, and New Mexico for the wildfires. So again, I would double check this, you know, make sure you confirm your status on QPP. You know, this doesn't encompass the entire state. There are certain areas. So please, please, please make sure to double check this and don't rely on the automatic portion of this EUC. You can always go ahead and, and actually manually submit it um, through your QPP portal as well. Okay, so let's move on to our second topic, the Cures Act. So keep in mind, we are just reviewing where we are now. Um, and, and really next year, this is not gonna be the entire in-depth analysis. We, we already have a webinar on this. Um, we encourage you to go back and watch it. And like I said, it'll really help you fill in some gaps here if your head's spinning by the time we get through this one. So again, quick recap. So for the past five years, you've probably heard terms like Cures Act, information blocking, um, interoperability or interoperability rule, you know, lots of terms or, or buzzwords floating around the healthcare industry lately. Well, these all revolve around some very important sets of laws that were released two years ago that have basically turned the healthcare industry on its head. So these laws refer to the 21st Century Cures Act. So you have the first one released by ONC. This is the actual 21st Century Cures Act. Um, then you have the second one that was released by CMS, and that one was called the Interoperability and Patient Access Rule. These rules work together to promote health information interoperability and then pro actually prohibit information blocking. There is a very strong healthcare IT focus, specifically information blocking, obviously, 
but looking at certified EHR technology updates and then TESCA. So those last two, you know, we had mentioned, you know, in our previous section at the PI category. So specifically in these rules, they provide a definition of what information blocking is. It's defined as the intentional withholding of patient health information or anything that interferes with access, exchange, or use of electronic health information or EHI. So keep in mind that anything could either be an action or an omission. It's also important to note that information blocking is not a requirement to proactively make all EHI available through patient portals, APIs, and other sort of technology available to us. It was enacted to address concerns such as lack of interoperability, um, sharing patient information, reducing healthcare costs, and overall improving patient safety. Really, it's to give patients greater control of their data. Now, lastly, and, and really most importantly, is who does this affect? Well, it affects actors. Um, and actors, as defined in the rule, are really made up of healthcare providers. So, you know, you all and, and your, your staff and your teams, um, health IT developers, so, you know, those who provide you your IT solutions, and then health information exchanges. So what will this mean for you? Um, and, and will you see penalties enforced if you don't properly comply? You know, what's at stake here? So this rule, you know, really changed how providers respond to requests from third parties for EHI as well as patients. So essentially, practices must respond in a timely manner to requests for access, exchange, or use of EHI from an authorized party in the content or manner requested, or claim one or more of the eight permissible exclusions or exceptions, assuming that they meet the, the conditions to do so. This means requests may now come in from a variety of sources, and your practice can be asked to share information in a specific format. This means your providers or practice are responsible for not information blocking when it comes to data requests not only from your patients, that's the obvious you know, scenario we think of, but other non-traditional requests. So think of a hospital request information, think of other practices are requesting information, um, you know, any, any sort or, or combination of an actor requesting that data now has to be complied with. Now for penalties, there's nothing totally defined as of yet, um, but civil monetary penalties have been proposed for certain violations. But they are coming and we know that. We can expect these to eventually come down the pipeline and affect providers um, in due time with further rulemaking. I, I could see that you know, being really hammered out and, and finalized next year. Now for some deadlines. So the final rule was issued in March of 2020, but it wasn't published until May of 2020. And then the compliance deadline was pushed out due to COVID. So the official deadline for this rule was April 5th, 2021. From then until just recently on October 6th, 2022, the information blocking rules that we just talked about applied only to a more narrow scope of EHI. However, now because we're past that deadline, this rule applies to all EHI. And we'll talk about the difference in the next slides. Now, lastly is the 2015 certified EHR technology deadline. We already went over this in our MIPS section, but this is where the mandate actually originated from. So as of 12-31-2022, ONC retires that 2015 edition and the 2015 Cures edition becomes the active certification starting January 1st, 2023. Now to elaborate you know, a little bit more on that October 6th deadline that just passed, um, before October 6th of this year, the term EHI for this rule was limited to what's called the USCDI version one data set. I'm not gonna go into the specifics because we're already past that. Um, and now this rule applies to the broader definition of all EHI in the HIPAA designated record set. So you can see, um, you know, based on the bullets here and also, you know, the, the graphic, this really added or started including, you know, billing records, payment and claims records, you know, anything else that's, that's included in what they define as the HIPAA designated record set. Now, I did mention you must comply to these information requests unless you meet an exception. You can see there are eight exceptions to the rule here. Um, we're not gonna dive into them all. Um, we are gonna highlight a few scenarios that 
you know, I think would, would give you the most feedback or, or real life scenarios that would apply to you um, and really impact your practice more often. So the first of three exceptions I think you'll come across most often is likely preventing harm. So what this means is it will not be information blocking for a medical practice to engage in actions that are reasonable and necessary to prevent harm to a patient or another person, provided certain conditions are met and the practice's actions are no broader than necessary. I did have to read that one straight through, sorry guys. <laughs> um, so what this means, for example, say you have a patient who has a history of high anxiety, um, and as, as their provider, you just received their test result confirming they have a malignant tumor. Delaying the release of that test result until you could discuss it with the patient in person because you believe they may actually harm themselves would fall under the preventing harm exception. The next exception is the health IT performance exception. Um, so ONC does actually recognize that health IT must be maintained and improved from time to time to perform properly. So this could mean that you have to you know, temporarily restrict a patient's access to their EHI while you install a system upgrade. You know, we have that 2015 cures update coming next year. At some point, maybe you know, a patient makes a request and they have to wait a little bit longer because you're mid-upgrade. Um, you know, on, especially on upgrade weekend, we know how crazy it can be. Um, so this is a valid exception. You just want to be careful on your timelines. You know, this, this, this exception can't last for six months. Um, and you want to make sure you have clear documentation. And lastly, the content and manner exception. So I saved the most confusing for last. Think content, what information you release. Think manner, in what format you release it. So here are some examples. If a patient requests XYZ data, um, but they want it via their patient portal, you would need to send them that data and you couldn't mail it. You would have to send it through the patient portal. Unless you don't have a patient portal then you could claim this exception and work your way through a rubric that HHS created and provided for this specific exception to determine what the next feasible way to get this information to the patient is. So another example, um, this one's becoming super popular. Patients are more and more requesting their health information for a cool new health app that they're working with. You know, maybe they're trying to track their, their weight or track some healthy behaviors, um, maybe their A1C levels, et cetera. Um, Unless you can work your way through this entire rubric that HHS provides you, it's on the ONC website, that basically asks questions on alternative options, you will need to get the patient the data they want in the form they want it. So you will need to provide that data and be able to get it in that app. Now this sounds scary, um, but one thing to point out is that this is only a problem if the patient isn't happy. If your patient is fine with getting their data via USB drive instead of a patient portal, for instance, then you're done. It's when both parties can't agree that will cause an issue. So really, my advice is to try and work with your patients and make sure they have what they need and they're satisfied with what and how you provided it because then you don't have an issue. You're not gonna be reported. Um, this could also be a big one for hospitals or other practices requesting data in a certain format. Just try and work together to find a solution Otherwise, it's an extensive amount of questions and alternatives you have to work through to claim this exception and withhold the data for it not to be information blocking. Um, and of course, keep in mind, these exceptions cannot be applied on a blanket, you know, overall policy basis. It has to be reviewed on a case by case basis and you have to have documentation to support each time one of these exceptions was used. Okay, so that was a lot of policies and kind of legal jargon thrown at you, which is you know, what we wanted to avoid. So let's bring this down to a level where we can understand how this applies with some actual examples of information blocking. Um, so one example, not responding to a data sharing request from three weeks ago because two of your MAs are out sick and the rest of your staff is extremely busy due to being you know, obviously temporarily understaffed. Um, the second example would be declining a data sharing request from another provider's office because that provider does not use the same EHR as your practice. Now, those two examples, I think are, are pretty obvious that that's information blocking, um, but there is one scenario that has been raising a lot of questions and getting a lot of attention from the industry. And that is, is it information blocking if we delay sending lab results to patients until the provider has a chance to review it? Now, HHS has responded to this question using a series of FAQs on their website that you can see here. Um, I also have the link here as well. 
Um, I highlighted the important portions for you that address this question, so I'm just going to read right from it. HHS says it would likely be considered an interference for purposes of information blocking if a healthcare provider established an organizational policy that, for example, imposed delays on the release of lab results for any period of time in order to allow an ordering clinician to review the results or in order to personally inform the patient of the results before a patient can electronically access such results. To further illustrate this, it would also likely be considered an interference where a delay in providing access, exchange, or use occurs after a patient logs into a patient portal to access their health information that a healthcare provider has, including lab results, and that health information is not available. Now, my interpretation of this is pretty clear, but I would recommend if you still have a, a similar policy in place, um, you know, I would definitely recommend you send over this link to your own compliance and legal department for their review and their interpretation of it. Um, I'm gonna be honest with lab results that I've just personally had um, with my own providers. I did get them in real time and there is a, you know, a, a warning underneath saying your provider may not have reviewed this prior to you reading this. So this is becoming more and more of the industry standard. Now, another question we get a lot is what technology do we need to be Cures Act compliant? Um, and we wanna clarify, the rule does not require a specific technology. Nowhere in the Cures Act does it even say you have to be on an EHR. However, interoperability solutions through your EHR, think patient portal, think the ability to send CCDAs, you know, all, all of these things, think anything electronic that your EHR allows you to do or share data-wise, um, can assist you in maintaining a strong interoperability posture and support your written compliance plan with this act. Um, so nothing specific is required. Obviously, I think you, we can all see the benefit of having a patient portal and how it would make compliance with this act much easier. Okay, so on to topic three, the No Surprises Act. And it's no surprise that we're flying through this. So. Officially, the No Surprises Act establishes federal safeguards against surprise medical bills that have taken effect on January 1st, 2022. Um, the goals of this act were specifically to protect patients from unknown costs and then ensure patients have access to the necessary information to understand the true cost of their care. So first and foremost, what even is surprise billing? Um, well, what's called a balance bill may come as a surprise for many people. So a surprise bill is actually just exactly what it sounds like. It's an unexpected bill from a healthcare provider or facility. This can happen when, you know, if you were to go to a, a, a health insurance, or I'm sorry, if you were to go to a healthcare provider and you get care and you did not know that they were out of your health plans network, this would be considered a surprise bill. Again, this situation can happen when you can't control who's involved in your care. Think if you were involved in a, an emergency situation or um, even when you schedule a visit, maybe at an in-network facility, but you're unexpectedly treated by an out-of-network provider. In some instances, a person's going to receive that, that bill from the out-of-network provider, and it's going to be much higher than the amount they would have otherwise paid or had planned to pay with their in-network care. So the No Surprises Act is going to protect individuals from those large unexpected bills. Now, who all is protected by this legislation? Well, as of January 1st of this year, this, this No Surprises Act or the NSA um, actually applies to all items and services provided to most individuals enrolled in private or commercial healthcare coverage. Now, there are some requirements that we're going to talk about today that also apply to uninsured or self pay individuals. But basically, the one thing I wanted to point out is that this does not apply to beneficiaries or enrollees in Medicare, Medicaid, Indian Health Services, Veterans of Air Health, or TRICARE. Now, the, the burning question here, who must comply with the No Surprises Act? And the answer is the No Surprises Act requirements apply to all healthcare providers and healthcare facilities. The statute does not exempt any categories of providers or facilities from this requirement. Oh, I almost wanna take a moment of silence to really let that sink in. All providers, no exception. I say almost because we don't have time to take a moment. So moving on. <laughs> Uh, now that I'm, I'm sure I, I have your attention, let's look at what this does exactly so you're informed of how this is going to impact your practice. So this is taken directly from CMS, and I'm going to summarize. 
but basically it's gonna prohibit your practice from directly billing individuals, that difference between the amount they charge and the amount the individual plan actually covers. It'll also require you to provide good faith estimates for charges for care to any uninsured or self-pay individuals. It creates a patient provider, excuse me, dispute resolution process for those uninsured or self-pay individuals um, to actually you know, contest those charges if they were a lot different from what the good faith estimate stated. It also created an independent dispute resolution process, we'll call this the IDR, um, for providers and health plans to actually determine the reimbursement amount when balance billing was not permissible. So when the No Surprises Act worked and shielded the patient from that surprise bill, then the provider and health plan had to duke it out on what the reimbursement would be. Now, the only things we will be covering in this webinar will be the good faith estimate and the independent dispute resolution process, and both at a very high level, just because both have had updates to these. Um, now, the Act, again, does so much more than this, so I encourage you to go back and listen to our webinar dedicated to only this topic to learn more. So let's start with the good faith estimate. So again, the NSA established this new requirement that you have to share a good faith estimate of the total expected charges for any scheduled items or services, including any expected ancillary services with an individual if the patient's uninsured or if they're self-pay, they're not utilizing their insurance. Um, and the notice has to include the expected billing and diagnosis codes for all items and services to be provided. And this requirement will apply whenever items or services are scheduled at least three days in advance or when requested by a patient. So your practices need to prov be providing a good faith estimate, you know, starting earlier this year to any uninsured or self-pay individuals. This means you have to determine if an individual who schedules with your practice has health insurance coverage. If they do, you then have to ask if they plan to utilize their health care coverage or if they plan to have the claims submitted to the plan. If they're not insured or they're not planning to use their insurance, the practice then have to, has to provide that good faith estimate. And this again has to include the cost for the entire period of care. So that could be a day or multiple days in which the primary service is performed. Let me give you an example. For a good faith estimate for a surgery. It's gonna include the cost of the surgery. It should also include the pre and post labs and testing, as well as anesthesia. It's not gonna include any services related to the surgery that may be scheduled separately. So pre-surgery appointments or uh, maybe you need PT after the surgery, it's not gonna include those. But you can see the graphic on the screen created by MGMA. This is gonna tell you if a good faith estimate has to be created or not. Reiterating what I just explained, um, it's a good way to organize your thoughts. Another NGMA graphic, but it's a good one. Um, this is gonna show you the timeline expected by CMS for providing these good faith estimates. So you can see it starts with a patient scheduling a service. Next, the convening provider, very technical term, but really just means the rendering provider, the one providing care, needs to reach out to any co-providers to get their good faith estimates for their services they may need to provide. Think if it was a surgery, the surgeon would be the convening provider, but the anesthesiologist would be the co-provider. Next, you need to provide the full good faith estimate to the patient within three business days of scheduling the services. So not only your office, but all other providers providing care, and then you have to you know, present this or give this to the patient. Now, due to COVID-19, CMS said they would basically delay the co-provider requirement by choosing not to enforce it until 2023. So that's only a, you know, a few weeks away, right? Well, thankfully, CMS did just announce that they are extending this enforcement discretion pending future rulemaking for that convening co-provider, you know, GFE requirements. So um, you do not have to include expected charges from co-providers or co-facilities starting January 1, 2023. Um, I included a screenshot of the FAQ, but I also included the link just in case you needed it for your records. Speaking of enforcement, the states are gonna actually have primary enforcement over, over the No Surprises Act. If the state does not provide adequate enforcement, then CMS will take over. So it kind of follows the same idea as HIPAA, right? HIPAA is the law of the land, but if your local laws are more stringent, you have to follow those. However, CMS may conduct random or targeted investigations or audits of providers or facilities at any time. They have, of course, reserved that right. 
And if you are found to have billed patients in violation of the No Surprises Act, you would be subject to civil monetary penalties of up to $10,000 per violation. However, um, these penalties wouldn't apply, or you can take them back, if the facility or if your practice did not knowingly violate the law and should not have reasonably known it violated the law. Apologies, because by attending this, web by attending this webinar, I think you, uh, you wouldn't fall into that bucket anymore. I think you know about this. Um, or if your practice chooses to withdraw the bill within 30 days, or if you reimburse the patient back any payments you receive plus interest, they would you know, go ahead and take that penalty away. Now, the next topic under the No Surprises Act that I said we would talk about is this Independent Dispute Resolution Process, or IDR. Um, it has been under a ton of scrutiny and has had a ton of updates to it, um, including a new final rule and even some new lawsuits. So again, high level, um, this independent dispute resolution process is for out-of-network care covered under the surprise billing protections. So providers and health plans are gonna use this process and that involves an independent arbiter to actually determine final payment for certain out-of-network care. So again, if someone receives out-of-network care, this process is gonna decide what the patient cost sharing would be since the practice could not balance bill to, due to this new legislation. So it's between the practice and the health plan. Here is a, a super helpful diagram. Again, it's from MGMA, but to remind you on who can balance bill under federal law with this new act um, and when the IDR process would apply. So reading through this, um, you can see all the different scenarios. I wanna focus on the last one on this list, um, if consent was received. If consent to balance bill the patient was not received, you need to go through the IDR process. If it was received, meaning the patient acknowledged that they may owe more for their out-of-network care and they're okay with that, the provider is just reimbursed under the normal out-of-network rate according to the health plan, and then they can balance bill the patient if, it, if your practice chooses to. So there are ways around this. Um, just keep in mind with this graphic, you know, especially emergency services, you know, that's never going to be a balanced billing situation anymore. So again, this is a 30,000 foot view. There are many, many, many details regarding this process that we won't get into today, but there have been some updates very recently on this process, and we wanted to provide at least a foundation of what it is and when it's used so you understand, you know, what's going on on the court side of the house. Um, the wildest part about this rule is that there are eight, well, technically now more than eight lawsuits that have been filed challenging the No Surprises Act in the last year. So the Texas Medical Association actually filed its third lawsuit earlier this month, um, the first week of December. The thing to note is that all of these lawsuits revolve around the same topic, which is the independent dispute resolution process we just went over. The lawsuits take issue with the rules requirement that the independent dispute resolution process presumes the qualifying payment amount or the QPA, which is the insurer or, or health plans median in-network rate is the appropriate out of network payment amount. Basically, healthcare practices are alleging that the rules basically artificially deflate the QPA, which is an insurer calculated amount used when deciding the appropriate out of network rate presented by you know, your practices. So the overall consensus is that the system is, is essentially rigged against doctors in favor of the insurer because you would not be getting reimbursed you know, as much as you normally would or considerably less. As a result of these lawsuits, HHS, HHS actually released a new final rule in August that took effect in October of this year. Its goal was to amend the emphasis that was placed on the QPA during the IDR process However, as we saw in the last slide, it clearly missed the mark since the Texas Medical Association just filed another lawsuit this month. Um, the issue is it is still believed the new rule favors insurers in this IDR process. Um, they think it's still pushing the IDR to consider the QPA over other factors, such as provider training and experience, um, how difficult it was to furnish the service or the provider's market share. Now, those in favor of the, of the new rule, you know, argue that although the, the QPA is an important factor, the statute lists, you know, the QPA is one of many factors that they can consider. And it specifically says in the rule to not give, you know, preference or outsized weight to any one factor. So, meanwhile, until the court decides whether this new final rule should stand, 
uncertainty about the whole IER process is actually creating a very large backlog. And when I say backlog, I mean backlog. <laughs> to put it in perspective, a survey conducted by Blue Cross Blue Shield Association uncovered that while the No Surprises Act did actually avert surprise bills for 9 million Americans from January to September of this year, it also completely overwhelmed this IDR process. So there were 275,000 instances submitted for this, this independent dispute resolution process. They expected there to be 17,000. That is less than a tenth of the actual amount. Um, and there are still over 90,000 disputes as of September 30th of this year. So that means some claims have been pending for eight or nine months. That's eight or nine months of not getting reimbursed or not getting paid. Um, so as you can see, there are still a lot of updates and changes likely to happen and, and, and to come surrounding this portion of the rule. So be on the lookout um, because it will impact your practice. Okay. So if that wasn't enough, let's quickly look at all the other updates that are going to impact you in 2023. Um, and there really only are a handful that I want to call out. First is HIPAA. You heard me right. HIPAA is expected to see changes early in 2023, specifically around record retrieval time and costs of electronic records. Under the new rule, healthcare providers' time to respond is reduced. So once this goes into effect, Basically, providers have to act upon the request as soon as it's practical, but no later than 15 calendar days. However, providers are entitled one 15 calendar day extension if they explain the delay and commit to a response date. So keep in mind, it's currently 30 calendar days from the receipt of request, so it's changing to 15. The other significant change aligns with the cost of electronic records and the effort required to produce an electronic copy. So if a patient requests a copy of their records delivered to them electronically, the new rule dictates that the reasonable cost-based fee is limited to labor only. So even if you know, a provider or your practice sends it to them, you know, sends their data to them on a CD through the postal service, you can only charge for the labor component. You cannot charge for the media, the envelope, um, the, the labels, the stamps, the other miscellaneous items I'm not thinking of. Um, it's just labor at this point forward for electronic records. Next is prior authorizations, and this one just came out last week. So CMS finally released its proposed rule on electric prior, electronic prior authorizations. This rule actually applies to Medicare Advantage, um, any ACA qualified health plans, as well as Medicaid and children's health insurance program, um, and Medicaid ma uh, managed care plans as well but it requires these plans to provide a clear reason for prior auth denials, publicly report on their prior auth approvals, denials, and appeals, respond to PA requests within certain timeframes, which is 72 hours for urgent or seven days for non-urgent, and implement and maintain an API to support and streamline the prior authorization process. This means automating the process for you know, practices to determine whether prior auth is required, identifying the information and documentation requirements for it, as well as facilitate the actual exchange of prior auth requests and decisions from your EHRs. The timeline to have this implemented is 20, 2026. Now note, the rule that was originally published in 2020 did not include MA plans. So again, keep in mind, these are now included in the newly proposed rule. Now, buried nice and deep in this proposed rule was this little bitty section on prior off reporting under MIPS, which if you know me and my team, we are like tracking hunting dogs following the MIPS scent. Um, if it's in there, we're gonna find it. So also included in this rule is a proposal for a new electronic prior off measure for MIPS eligible clinicians under the promoting and operability performance category of MIPS. Um, same thing, this would also apply to hospitals and critical access hospitals. But to meet this measure, a prior auth must be requested electronically using that API, using your EHR. Under this proposal, basically you'd be required to report the number of prior auths for medical items and services, not drugs, that are requested electronically from an API using data from your certified EHR. Again, this is not finalized, but we will definitely be keeping an eye out on this one as well. We also wanna make sure everyone is aware of the upcoming deadline for electronic prescribing of controlled substances or EPCS. 
Um, starting January 1st, 2023, EPCS will be enforced by CMS for all Schedule 2, 3, 4, and 5 controlled substances for Medicare Part D. This was supposed to start in 2021, and it was delayed twice to 2023 because of COVID. So again, keep in mind, this is for Medicare Part D, but the federal government isn't the only one mandating e-prescribing for controlled substances. Many states already have their own deadlines and requirements for this. And you can see based on the graphic, again, many states already have this in place. Some start January 1st, 2023, and you even have some that are, are started to begin in, in January 1st, 2024. So please take note of this and check your specific state requirements as well. And last but not least is appropriate use criteria. Um, if you remember, this was supposed to take effect multiple times, but has been delayed due to COVID. Um, it has officially been delayed indefinitely, as you can see from the announcement on the CMS homepage. If you don't remember AUC, it's the requirements to consult a clinical decision support mechanism when you're placing an advanced diagnostic imaging service. So this was strategic to end on a happy note here, right on time, um, that hopefully takes something off your plate for, for 2023. So that is all we had for you today. Uh, and believe me, there, there really is so much more we could have covered. So for next steps, um, please visit our website and continue to sign up for our webinars. Also, please review the previous webinars I mentioned in our presentation today. They will be extremely helpful to fill in any gaps you may have. Um, also consider our healthcare industry advisor offering for areas of expertise on topics, you know, exactly like this. Um, as well as assistance with MIPS. We have packages to help you in any way, shape, or form you need, whether it's complete assistance, start to finish, submission only. If you just want another set of eyes with a periodic check-in or mock score or a resource for questions, um, you name it, we can make it work. We also offer certified registry as an option for reporting, and we support specialty registry reporting as well. Now, as we mentioned, we won't be doing a live Q&A today due to time, so please feel free to put your questions in, in the questions panel. Um, Kimmy and Bridget have been collecting these for us throughout the presentation to put on a spreadsheet. We're actually gonna be reviewing all together to reply to each of you individually after the presentation. Um, if something comes up or we end today's call before you had a chance to put your question in the chat, please feel free to reach out to me at my email address listed on the screen and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, also, feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more about how my team can help your practice prepare for these upcoming changes and requirements in 2023 and beyond. So thank you all again for, for hanging in there with me. I know it, was, it wasn't easy. Um, it was a long one, but Chelsea, I will hand it back over to you for, for any closing comments. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you everybody for hanging on there with us. I know that this was so much information that Lindsay just loves to throw it all out there for you, and, and we know that it was a lot. So again, I just want, want to remind you that we will be sending out a link to the recording and the slides so that you have that all to reference. Uh, you see Lindsay's information up on the screen. You can also always reply back to the email that I'll be sending. Basically, any way you can get a hold of us, we're happy to help. Don't hesitate to ask. That's why we do these things. Uh, we know that this is really complicated, and, and we're happy to provide any support that we can. And um, besides that, thanks again, and, and happy holidays. And we'll, we're looking forward to seeing you in the new year with a bunch of great new webinars as well. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.